Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, my name's Ed I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> By the grace of God, Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and sponsorship, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink or a mood-altering chemical since January 5th of 1971, and for that I'm extremely grateful. <laughs> yeah, I know I'm too young and pretty to be sober that long, huh? <laughs> I want to I thank Kim. I just... Uh, there are certain people you meet along the road, and, and I'm blessed to meet a lot of people, but uh, I knew Kim was going to be all right that night I met her, and uh, uh, she's been in my prayers every day since then, and, and if i got anything to do about it, she'll remain in my prayers every day since today, because uh, uh, alive in her was the magic and music of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I want to thank Eric for inviting me, and Perry, and Mike for picking me up at the airport in his little compact car. That was fun. <laughs> No, he had a Monte Carlo. It's a big car. <laughs> Not. <laughs> but it was. I really appreciate. It. I like Mike. He's a good guy. And I'm here with a lot of wonderful people. I'm seeing people I haven't seen in quite some time. My friend Cindy, who's going to be talking, and uh, Peg, of course, is going to be talking, and, and Dick and Peg. I love them very much. Uh, and I'm not saying that because they're taping me. I'm saying that because I know them well and I've watched them well and their actions speak so loud a lot of times I can't hear a word they say. And that's what keeps me coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, when I was uh, first started speaking... Got on that circuit, you know what I mean, Kim? <laughs> and uh, I was a little annoyed because I've, I've been around since they used to do the reel-to-reel tapes. <laughs> you know, about halfway through your talking, you go... And then it, they used to be great. They'd ask and they'd do everything. And then all of a sudden it was like, we're taping you, you know. And I had a little burr under my saddle about that. I was just a little annoyed about that. And I remember in 1988 I moved from Southern California back to uh, Davenport, Iowa, where I live now. And I had just been through a very difficult divorce, like any of them aren't difficult. But uh, And my phone rang like five times at 2 o'clock in the morning, and they'd hang up as soon as I'd answer it. I'm thinking it's my ex trying to give me a little spiritual advice. And the fifth time it rang, I picked it up and said, Who is this? And this little gal said, Is this Ed M. that talks in AA? And I said, Yes. And she said, I'm sitting here in my room. I've got five years sober. And I was going to commit suicide, but I just listened to your tape. Would you talk to me? Now, the reason that story is on my mind tonight is because somebody was here in Melbourne, Florida, where I talked earlier last year. And I, I don't share that story off, but I shared it. And uh, in the reception line afterward, there was a lady come up and said, I'm the girl. You know? It's wonderful what they do. It's carrying the message in a way that helps a lot of us. Helps a lot of us. And from that point on, copy it, tape it, sing it, sell it, do whatever you need to do. <laughs> because uh, the magic of music of Alcoholics Anonymous is alive and well. Uh, you may not have noticed I'm tall. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, yes, I have trouble buying clothes and the weather's fine up here. <laughs> Get all those out of the way. I... Uh, it's always the same two questions by the same size person. First question is, Oh, how tall are you? <laughs> and I say 6'10". They say, Oh, do you play basketball? <laughs> I say, No, how tall are you? And they say, 5'4". And I say, Do you play miniature golf? <laughs> Seems fair to me. They made the rule, you know. And... People are funny, and when, when you're big, you tend to get a lot of attention. Not always good. But uh, I'm in a grocery line one day, and sometimes people get in attitudes. Well, why didn't you play basketball? 
And I looked at her and I said, you know, I had a drinking and a drug problem from a very early age and I didn't realize I was this tall until I got sober. <laughs> she didn't get it. You guys do. Huh? 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 I love Alcoholics Anonymous, I love God, and I love being sober, and I don't apologize for any of them anymore. You know? I just, uh, just absolutely love being alive. And, and it's just, this weekend has just uh, been so nice for me, I forget that so many people love me and care about me. And it just touches me when I see the faces that I haven't seen for a while. And that they're still here too, you know. And, and we're working together and we're walking together on this road of life called Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know about you, but I wasn't interested in living before I came here. I'm so glad when I was new somebody didn't come up to me and say, you know, if you keep drinking and using like that, you're going to die. I would have thought, excellent, where do I sign up? Because <laughs> I wasn't interested in living. If I was interested in living, would I be doing all this stuff? The answer is no, and dying didn't scare me then, it doesn't scare me now, but for other reasons. I come from a very elite group of people called white trash. <laughs> we had a certain reputation to maintain, and we did quite well at it, you know. Cops had to come to your house once or twice a week, needed a car parked out front up on blocks, you know. We did it well, and I joke about it tonight, but I need to tell you that was the toughest thing for me to shake after I got sober. Long time that I was white trash and I didn't have a place in this world because it seemed I heard that everywhere I went. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of peculiar. I, uh, I could walk into a room of 300 people. 299 could turn around and say, Ed, you're the best. We love you. And one could go, jerk. Guess who got my full attention? Not only did they get my full attention... But I know this is hard to believe. After a while, the 299 didn't even exist. Just the ones. And I started loading them in my pack and walking this road of life. At a very early age, my knees got wobbly, and I needed a drink. I needed a drink badly. I don't know when I took my first drink, because Dad used to think it was funny uh, to get me drunk. I'm the youngest of seven children. You should see my big brothers. But... uh uh, Dad used to think it was funny and uh, uh, get drunk, so I don't know that it ever went boom for me. I suppose it did. I, I know this. I was talking to a, a new guy I'm working with, and, and, and I just didn't want to feel. And it started young. I just did not want to feel. I'd rather take a beating than feel. And so I did whatever I could so I didn't have to feel. And early on in life, I... I you know, I started my 299 to 1 theory, and man, there's a lot of ones. I know you guys wouldn't do anything like this, but I even took it into... I remember Mom used to drag us to church. And I don't know about you, but all ministers and people that go to church have thin blue lips and talk like this. And I remember going to that church, and that minister would look at me and say, You're going to burn in hell, young man. You're going to burn in hell. And I used to think, How do you know? You only know me for 20 minutes. What I should have said is, you'll be there too, you know. But I'd just get mad, and that's what I remembered. That was my one about church, and there was one guy that sat up front every week, and he had thin blue lips, looked like this, and just glum. And I thought, you know, he was having a lot more fun in the bar last night. And I don't know who that grump is he's sitting with, but the other woman seemed to be a lot more fun too, you know. Now, I know you're not this sick, but I didn't only judge that church by my limited experience. I judged entire organized religion by a little church in Davenport, Iowa, and one guy sitting up front. They're all hypocrites and liars. Never did I entertain that behind him may be some of the finest people I've ever met in my life, because I had my one. I went to my first AA meeting when I was 10 years old. I've got a brother soon to be 45 years sober, and uh, next week. And he's so dry, we don't let people smoke around him anymore, you know. Just, and uh, he, took me to that, he took me to that A&A meeting, and I remember going there, and there was some old guy up here, about 30, just, <laughs> and my name's Fred, and I'm an alcoholic, and I thought, good for you, Fred. If I ever get old and burn out, I'll be here, too. <laughs> I didn't know I was a prophet at that point, it just, but... Uh, 
And I share that with you because for the next 10 years when I went out there and I hit the streets and I hit them hard, I didn't think about 12 steps. There's other people other than this speaker talking tonight. Got people out there we really love that are dying of this disease. And we've tried to carry the message as my brother did to me. And it just didn't register and it was not his fault. Not once did I stop and think, you know, I I need to go find 12 golden steps and find God. I need to go to A&A and bring food for the potluck. My problem was the same as your problems. It was memories. It was might have been. It was if onlys. All the if onlys. And there's only one thing that will take that away if you're a person like me. And that's a few drinks and eventually anything else I can ingest. I, there is one thing I never remember saying in all of my uh, drinking life. Because I was one of those that would take anything. I never remember saying, oh, what will these do to you? (laughs) It was, tell you more? (laughs) And all I wanted was out. The last thing I wanted to do is feel. The last thing I wanted to know is what I did last night. Oh, God, do you have those friends, too, that wanted to help you out if you forgot? (laughs) You know, sometimes I'd lie about blackouts. I love blackouts. I'd lie. I don't remember a thing. I remembered it all, but I ain't telling you, you know. January 5th of 1971, I was in a car accident, which wasn't unusual for me. I had this unique idea and thought that uh, after a few drinks, I was a better driver. And uh, thank God I wasn't driving that night. And I remember uh, laying in the middle of the street. It was 18 below zero. It's January, you know. And uh, I was laying in the middle of the street pretending like I was knocked out. I'm not sure why, but it seemed like the thing to do at the time. (laughs) And I remember the cops pulling up. Are there any other cop fighters here? Oh, come on. Thank you very much. Inventory time. Meet my room right after this. No. But, But I was a cop fighter. I got news for you. I didn't know this. There's always more of them. Who knew? And I was registered that if I saw a badge, I swung. I don't care if you were a crossing guard. I was going to take you out. <laughs> and usually you work. I'm thinking about it. But uh, I'm laying there in the middle of the street, and I hear these cops coming up, and they say, that's mute him. Don't touch him. He's the scum of the earth. Car's probably hot. He's a punk. And I laid there. I laid there. And I agreed. All of a sudden that night it was quite clear to me it had nothing to do with where I was raised, what kind of education I did or didn't have, what kind of social economic environment I came from. It was perfectly clear that I couldn't drink anymore. And for me I couldn't put anything in my system to alter my reality. And I had to do whatever I had to do not to do that anymore. And that was my little gift from God. I remember they took me up to the hospital and rolled me past this nurse. And the nurse said, do you want me to call AA Ed? And I went, might as well. Now us old timers want to know why you new people can't be sincere like we were in the old days. You know? <laughs> and I remember the next day, I was drinking the good stuff this time. It was a little Thunderbird, a little Mad Dog 2020, a little Golden Glow beard, 273 a case. Good stuff. Now that in the Ariba... The Ariba was a tough wine. It never saw a grape ever. And, and in order to drink the Ariba, you had to hold the nose to get it down. And if you got a whiff before, then it was a big mess. And so I was out having fun that night. And the next morning, I've got one of those wine hangovers. Aren't they fun? And I dry heat, you know, from your toes. And I'm just. And this guy comes walking in named Hap, short for Happy from AA going, hi, Ed, my name's Hap. I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought, get out of my room. (laughs) And he stayed and he said, we don't drink and we don't use one day at a time. And I don't know why I got honest with this guy. I'd never been honest before. I didn't know how to. I didn't think. I said, you don't get it. I can't make it a whole day without something, man. When this gets going and this gets going, I got to have something. And he said, Ed, all you have to do is try. 
That's the only thing I've done consistently from that day to this is try. Sometimes greatly, sometimes barely. But I've always tried to do better than I did yesterday. And I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew instinctively to keep busy. In the area I was in, sponsorship wasn't big back then. It's, it's a little better now, but uh, I wasn't about to bother anybody. Uh, I was one of those people that came into AA and looked both ways because I didn't want to embarrass you. You know, I, I went to my folks, my people, and one meeting in Davenport, and they said, you got to leave because they knew me. And oddly enough, I started going to a businessmen's meeting. Everybody wore suits, and my keen alcoholic mind said, they're all cops. <laughs> That's why they're wearing suits. It's just a matter of time where they bust. But why I stayed there was when I went in, oddly enough, a guy didn't look at how I was dressed. And, I mean, I was looking socially acceptable. I had shoulder-length hair, really, and uh, dark had glasses, dark glasses on so I could see you and you couldn't see me, tie-dyed shirt, uh, jeans, leather boots up to the calves, fringe on them, motorcycle belt, swastika around my neck. I wasn't sure what that was about, but I knew you got mad. And I walked into the meeting, you know. And John came up in his suit, said, Hi, my name's John. What's yours? And looked me right in the eye. And I said, is Ed? And he said, come on in, Ed. And I didn't know how to react to that. Hadn't heard that in a long time, so I came in. You know, a lot of times we say it isn't important what we say to new people. I beg to differ. It is important what we say to new people. And he welcomed me. And I, I knew, I knew I had to keep busy. And in the old days, you, when you got sober, you just got sober. You know, now it, newcomers aren't any fun anymore. They really aren't, especially if they're in treatment. They come to meetings. That's it. And uh, when I came to meeting, I was a shaker. Any other shakers here? Please be some shakers. Oh, good, yeah. I was... How are you? Oh, good. You're nice to see you. Cup of coffee? Ha <laughs> ha. No thanks. Jeez. Want a piece of cake? Nope. Can't have sharp objects. Oh, gee. And my arms are just kind of. And that went on for a while. <laughs> and I had two basic rules. One was don't come up behind me. And the other one was don't touch me. Very simple rules. You know, Harry, Harry Stevens, he didn't know the rules. And I'd be sitting at the meeting I was sitting in last night. And old Harry would come up, and he, he was the coffee pourer. And Harry would put his hand right here on my shoulder. And he'd pour coffee. And the minute he put his hand on my shoulder, there was a peace that came over me and a calm. And everything was all right for the first time in my conscious memory. The madness stopped. And he'd pour my coffee. And then he'd go. So I'd drink my coffee just as quick as I could. My only regret is I never told Harry, thank you, Harry. Thanks for that touch of God's hand. That unconditional love. That you reached out and you touched me. Because like I said, I wasn't too touchable. I remember I had my look, my sneer. I had my look because I had to back you up going in. You know, if I back you up going in, then we'll see how it goes from there. And I remember I walked into a meeting one day, and old Logan said, Ed, how you feeling? I said, fine. He said, why don't you tell your face? Ed don't know. <laughs> there was more than one habit I had to break when I got here. And I remember about six months sober, you get honesty, and about eight months, you get a little tack to go with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you're new or used... Uh, I'd suggest you wait till you get the tack, just my two cents. And there was a priest there named Father Tom, thin blue lips, you know what I mean. Father Tom said, Ed, why don't you come back to church? And I had that honesty part, and I looked right at him. I said, I'll tell you why I don't go back to church. It's full of thieves, hypocrites, and liars. Felt pretty good about telling him, too. He took a minute, looked back, and said, well, why don't you come, Ed? One more won't hurt. 
I punished him. I didn't talk to him for two, three months. You know what I mean? <laughs> Old timers tell you the truth. Just don't talk to him. <laughs> About that same time, I got my own key to the club. Yeah, I was a rocket starter. <laughs> and I had my feet up on the table one day, and Logan, God bless him, came in. He died with 56 years plus sobriety. Logan walked in and said, you think you got all the answers, don't you, kid? And I said, no, but I was thinking, yep, pretty much got this wrapped up. <laughs> and he said, let me tell you something. I was young once, but you've never been old. I was young once, but you've never been old. It is the first time in my life I've ever entertained the possibility you have felt the way I feel. And I'm not alone anymore. First glimpse I ever had of it. Now, I made a mistake my first year sober, and I beg you not to make the same mistake. I started professing a faith I didn't have. Now, they brought up this, they brought up this three-letter word. <laughs> you know which one I mean. Job. <laughs> and uh, said I had to go to work, and I thought, you know, I'm doing just fine. Stealing, making ends meet, and just, you know. I hated that <laughs> when I was growing up, I felt really deprived because I couldn't be a burglar anymore. You can't be my size and be a burglar or a second story man, maybe, you know, because they'll just be, it was him, officer, you know. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that. Anyway, my name's Ed and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> but they brought up that three-letter word, job, and, uh, and I started that, and then they brought up the God word. And I mean, I, in the book, it talks about being, being violently anti-religious. I used to say that I was an atheist, I was this, I was that. You know what? It took me a lot of years to figure it out, but I realized all that was wrong. I believed in God, and everything I believed, I absolutely hated. I had a bushel basket full of one where God's concerned. Rip people out of my life that I love for no particular... There's a God, why are there starving children in the world? There's a God, why is all, why'd all this happening? Why did my eyes have to see what it saw? Keep that God crap. Or I'll give it back to you. Imagine my surprise when I come into AA and they said, if you're going to have any sobriety of any length, of any quality, it must be with a relationship, personal relationship with God of your very own. It was a bit depressing when I heard it. But then they give me some good news. They said it can be a God of your very own. And I thought, I can make one up? And they said, yeah, you can do that. You just got to believe in it. So I thought long and hard, and I come up with a God that was kind and loving and forgiving. <laughs> How do you like them apples, huh? <laughs> they didn't seem to mind. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you know how they are in AA, any original idea. They say it's already been round, you know. And the reason I say that is that was just 180 degrees from anything I believed about any kind of God. It was kind and loving and forgiving. But the mistake I made is this. I started professing more of a faith than I had. And I didn't do it intentionally. But I'd sit and go to meetings and I hear old-timers and Alcoholics Anonymous as a result of their experience in working through the steps and sponsorship and a relationship with God, sharing their experience. And I took their words and started sharing their words and claiming them as my own. Now, if you do that, there's only one thing wrong with that. There may be a time when you need more than that. I was a little over a year sober. I just celebrated a year sober, and the old man asked me over for dinner. Now, I don't know about you, but when my old man asked me over for dinner, somebody was in trouble, and it's usually me. And I remember I didn't want to go to dinner, but I'd been hanging around you A&A folks. And you told me that if I had to bring a new attitude into old situations, that I can't wait for them to change. It's my program, not theirs. So I dressed up and I went over there and had dinner. And about halfway through dinner, Dad said, Ed? Oh, no, what he said is, boy. And I thought, oh, God. Shivers down my spine. I said, yeah, Pop. He said, just want to tell you I'm proud of you. Now, I need to tell you something. When I walked in the house that night, if you'd hooked a lie detector up to me and said, do you care what your old man thinks of you, I would have said no and would have said true. I'm so grateful I was so horribly wrong and about so many other things now that I've been sober a while. When he said that, 
It was beyond my wildest dreams. You know, when they say when you get sober, expect miracles. And I'm one of those guys. If you want to be just one of them that slug along and plug along, more power to you. I expect miracles in my life every day, and I get them. I get them every single day. Because that's what the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous promises me. A conscious contact with a kind and loving God that I can see the goodness in the world. Because I knew all the bad. And man, when the old man told me that, it was one of the best nights of my life. And I went to a meeting afterwards and went over to my sister-in-law's house and got a call from my mother who was crying and hysterical and said, Ed, come home quick. And I said, Mom, what's wrong? She said, Dad went across the street to get him a quart of beer and me a bottle of pop, and now they're carrying bodies out. I don't know what's going on. Please come home. And I jumped in the car, and it was one of those ice storms we get here in the Midwest, quarter-inch ice over everything. It took me a while to get there, and I'm thinking, well... God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. I got God in my life now. Nothing bad can happen. It's not a big deal. And I pulled up to the bar where I'd been drinking since I was 11 years old. And there were more policemen there than I'd ever seen, ever. It's funny how those cops had shaped up that year I was sober. Another little piece of advice, if you're new, you don't talk about their heritage, they usually won't talk about yours. Amazing little information I got after I got sober. And I walked in there, and uh, one of the cops said to me, Ed, what are you doing here? And I said, my old man was in here. He said, oh, God, Ed. And I said, why? What's wrong? He said, all we can tell you, all we know is somebody came in and opened fire and shot everybody. And I looked down the bar, and I saw this pool of blood with my father's glasses all smashed up in it. And I knew, but I didn't want to know. I'm excellent at not wanting to know. I drink not to know. And I said, what do I do? And they said, go up to the hospital. All the bodies have been taken up there. Some are alive, some are dead. Go up there and see. And I went up there to the hospital, and I ran into an officer who hadn't forgotten my past and wasn't willing to. And he was rude, and he was vulgar, and he was obnoxious. And he told me in a very unkind way to get out of there before he'd have me run in. And he'd identified all the bodies. My old man wasn't in there. Now, get on out of there. And an AA miracle happened. I said, okay, and I left. I'm a cop fighter, and nobody talks to me that way. Not while I'm standing. Nobody. And you know, I didn't even register with me that night. I said, okay. And I went home, and I went and I called the one guy that you would have never convinced me I would have called, and that was the cop that tried to put me away for the last five years of my drinking and using. He put me in the back of his squad car one day and he said, Ed, if I see you leaving the scene of the crime or think I see you leaving the scene of the crime, I'm going to shoot to kill and not stop. And I said, everything's fair in love and war, chump. You know, if a cop takes me out, I'm a hero. I'm somebody, finally. That's the guy I call. And he said, Ed, what's going on? And I said, Bob, my dad was in the tavern. He said, oh, God, Ed, hold on. And he fed me information. Now, you know he ain't supposed to do that. But he did. And he said, oh, Ed, all we can come up with is he either got shot and wandered outside or they'd taken him hostage. So we'll form a search party. And all night we walked those streets, eight, ten hours. And I was looking in garbage cans for my dad and under parked cars and abandoned garages. You didn't want to look, but you got to look. Because if you don't look, that might be where he is. And all night long I walked. And early the next morning that officer from the hospital called up and said, well, Ed, uh, can you come up and identify your old man? Anybody could have made a mistake. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I went up there, and I drove up to that hospital, and I walked into that morgue, and I saw that bullet hole in my father's base, face, and it just got cold inside of me because I reached for that faith I'd been professing and came up with absolutely nothing. A lot of nice words, a lot of nice cliches, a lot of other people's experience. And I don't know that I've ever been more lonely or isolated in my life. I hear a lot of people say, you know, my best day sober isn't, uh, my worst day sober isn't as good as my best day drunk, however they say that crap. And that's just not my experience because before I got sober, I didn't feel nothing. And now all of a sudden, here's life right in my face, and man, I'm feeling it to my toes. And some of you know what I was feeling. Eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Even it up. Quickly. Quickly. And I had this A&A &A stuff going on in my head. 
God, did I feel alone. And I walked out of there and there was a member of AA and l and already been at the hospital and they just looked at me and they, they, they gave me a little wink and a little thumbs up. That was God that day. Came to me when I didn't call, when I didn't ask. And that was God that day. And everywhere I went, there were members of AA and l and just looking at me, knowing the heartbreak. Some of them knowing the anger. Very few, but some of them knowing the anger. I'm so grateful for that. Because I couldn't have done it at all. That is beyond my comprehension. At the funeral, the priest said something that changed, uh, changed my life and gave me one of the keys to the kingdom. <coughs> Excuse me. He said, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people would say Clifford's death is God's will. He said, I don't believe that for a minute. And I sat right up in the chair. He said, God created human beings, gave us all a free will. Some of those human beings chose to do this act. And now it's God's will. And it was like the weight of the world fell off my shoulders. You mean that God I made up just may be true? And from that day to this, I believe this with everything in me. If it isn't good, it isn't God. Period. My God doesn't play cheap intellectual lessons to teach me things. He loves me. In spite of me. Day in and day out. And he's always there. And I learned about that in Alcoholics Anonymous. By the members who surrounded me. Shortly after that funeral, I got called up and I had to testify... I remember going into court, and I'd never had a suit on before. You know, it just wasn't my thing. And so they they got together, and they got me a suit that didn't fit well at all. You know, it was one of these things. And, and uh, Then they made an impossible request. They said, now you need to behave yourself in court. I've never done that in my life. I mean, that's your chance to shine, right? You know, get enough deputies on you. Nobody's going to miss you when you hit mess with you when you hit county. Yeah, you'll be bruised and sore for a few days. It'll, it'll wear off. And they said, you may be the only example of AA they see. So I, they said I had to simply answer the questions. And I remember walking into that courtroom and there was some guy sitting there with his do and his little attitude talking stuff to me. And I thought, you know, you give me five minutes. We don't need a trial. In fact, bring all five of the guys in. We really don't need a trial. But I behaved myself. And I simply answered the questions. And I went home. And they did a fine job. They convicted all the guys and they went away to prison. Shortly after that, God talked to me. Now, you've got to be careful when God talks to you. Sponsors are excellent God strainers, you know, just filters to find the true message. I remember one time I went to my sponsor and when I was out in California, I said, you know, I... God gave me a message. He said, what's that, Ed? And I told him, and he said, you know, Ed, this message from God looks strangely like your handwriting. Right. You know? <laughs> Great. <laughs> but I'm also well aware, if you read the pages 86, 87, 88 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you don't, then you've never met, had an acquaintance with the 11th step, and I don't know why you wouldn't, but if you don't, I'd suggest you read that, because in those three pages, it not only tells you how to live every second of every moment of every minute of every day, how to get up, how to go to bed, and what to do all times in between, but it also tells me that I am to have a conscious relationship with God, and that I will live that way, and I do. And it's not because I got something special going. It's because Alcoholics Anonymous, these steps in this big book, and God has something awful special going. Well, God talked to me, and he said, Ed, go out to California, get into show business. <laughs> Made sense to me. Packed my bags, went to where all stars get their start, Anaheim, California. I got a job <laughs> at Disneyland. I was goofy. Little did they know how well I fit the role at that point. You know, <laughs> Step on goofy shoes, like, eh? you know little hostility, not much. That's when I was still processing my anger. Uh, people processing my anger and working through my issues. Ah, really, I love that. They say, I'm working through, you know, I have a lot of old issues. I said, do you have any Playboy? <laughs> I guess they were talking about something else. I don't know. 
And that stuff's all well and good. It just doesn't belong in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's excellent. It helps a lot of people. It does a lot of good. It just has no place or purpose in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I remember I didn't actually start that job. I went up to a meeting in West L.A., and there was a guy. I went into a meeting on a Tuesday night. We had a big meeting. It was big, like 400 people, and there were people everywhere. People shaking hands and smiling, teeth everywhere. Good-looking women, too. Oh, God. And uh, my spiritual experience. And uh, like they'd touch me with a dead football. Uh, but and I'm being cute there, but what I did see, honestly, was uh, people being alive and sober. Just more than going to meetings, going home, reading the book. Oh, pray every now and then. Every once in a while, get a chip. Thanks. Happy birthday. And that's good for a lot of people. I'm not putting that down. I just needed a little more gas in my tank, you know. And this group seemed to have it. They were doing everything. I went up there the next week, and there was this guy running around uh, being a big deal, I guess. I don't know. I, I, it just seemed like he was everywhere I looked. And I said, excuse me, would you be my sponsor? He said, no. And I said, why not? He said, anybody I sponsor has to look up to me. Ha, ha, ha. I thought, oh, tall jokes. That's what I need to hear, yeah. And he stuck out his hand. He said, my name's Clancy. You agree to do a few things. I'll be your sponsor. And I'm forever grateful I didn't hear half the crap that goes around about him, even if it's true. You know why? I would have believed you and you would have killed me. Because just as Bill brought the message to Bob and he heard it, Clancy brought the message to me and I heard it. Gossip and nonsense has got to stop. It's really got to stop. If you're around somebody, if you're around somebody that gossips a lot, you're the next topic as soon as you leave. <laughs> and make new friends because you don't want friends like that anyway. You know? Honest to God. I try my best not to put down any group or individual in AA. I may not like what they're doing, but I don't want to sacrifice the dignity of your own decision by my bias and my hatred, my character defects. You know, everybody thinks they got the right way of doing it. Well, no, by God's grace, we're all here doing it. And we got different ideas and walk different ways, but we're all in this room together as one, as members of Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon. Now, I know they're two separate entities. Don't come up afterwards. I understand that. And so I moved into Clancy's garage. Seemed like the thing to do at the time. <laughs> Two and a half years sober, and Clancy was, Clancy's a powerful guy in L.A., and he pulled a lot of, lot of strings and got me a job as a bellhop. And I, I had a great little outfit, too, there. It was a little blue a little coat, and I had a little blue hat, too. <laughs> and I was at the Royal Inn in Santa Monica from 11 to 7. Little old ladies had come in and dropped their bag on my feet. Pick up that bag, boy. And I'd think, which one? You or it? <laughs> but my sponsor told me something that I value. He said, I don't care what you think. They don't lock you up for what you think. They lock you up for how you act. You think anything you want, you watch how you act. And I'd take that bag upstairs, and I'd take it into the room, and I'd go to the door and wait for the tip. And she'd sl shut the door and like to break my fingers. And I'm thinking, I'm going to kick in the door, grab this old broad door out the window and watch her splatter. <laughs> but what I did is say, thank you, and I'd go downstairs. Doesn't sound like much, does it? It's called step three. Hmm. Freedom from the bondage of self. You see, I didn't know that feelings were not facts. I thought if I thought it, it was the truth. I know that sounds crazy to you. But I thought if I thought it, it was the truth, and I had to follow through. I didn't know that I could be disciplined. And how did I find that out? Because I was blessed to have a sponsor whose voice was louder than my head. And at times, and screaming, raving brats would scream at me, and I'd stop like that. And it just told me that all I got to do is break the concentration. And he'd always tell me the same thing, go help somebody. Go do something. Go fix something. And it always, always worked. I remember I started going to meetings, and uh, uh, he told me some stupid stuff. 
He said, I want you to shake all these people's hand. I said, you know, and the group was like 400. He said, I want you to shake everybody's hand. I said, I don't like them people. He said, they don't like you either, Ed. <laughs> so I go, hi, I'm Ed. Hi, I'm Ed. I'm Ed. <laughs> Could say I had a little attitude problem from time to time. I have a sponsor that loves me enough to tell me the truth. I remember the night he called me, or the day he called me down to his office and said, Ed, uh, your sarcasm in your mouth is driving away the very people that love you the most. You might want to look at that. You know what it was to me? Quick-witted humor. Right. That's what it is. It's just one-upsmanship. It's just, not to me, it was a power play. and It was character assassination, and I was excellent. I remember one night I asked, I said this prayer, and if you're, you're good at sarcasm, don't say this prayer to really goof it up. But I said, God, show me the effects my humor really has on people. And I was in Ohio Street, I think on a Sunday night in West L.A., meeting there, and this little gal come up, I can't remember her face for the life of me, I remember her eyes. And she was happy and just up and just... And she came up and said something to me, and I gave her one of my one-liners. <clears throat> and laughed and turned and walked away, and I got about ten steps... And her eyes came to mind. And I saw the pain that my smart remark made. And I cried. I need to tell you something. When I'm fighting the cops, screaming at the top of my lungs for more, all I ever wanted to do was just get along. That's all I ever wanted to do. And what am I doing? I'm in a group of men and women who absolutely love me or at best tolerate me. And I drive them away with my humor. I don't do that anymore. If I want to say something witty to them, I say something loving to them. It seems to last a little longer, too. I remember there was a guy, Jimmy Ryan, out in California. Cindy remembers him, I think, from Malibu. Jimmy was from Dallas, Texas. He'd talk like this. He'd rub his hands together. He'd give you rapid fire talk. He'd give you talk three talks in time one. You know what I mean? He was just rapid fire. He'd just go. He said, one time I asked some psychologist why I rubbed my hands together like this. He said, he told me, he said, I smacked him right in the mouth. And uh, that was Jimmy. And I was suicidal. I know that none of you have had that sober. But about three years sober, I, and I had that deep suicidal stuff. And uh, through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and 12 Steps, I no longer have depression, and that's all I've used. I know that upsets a lot of people. Just pray for me. <laughs> but... Uh, I was in that dark space, and if you've been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. My plan was to go to Clancy's garage and to turn on all the gas under the big coffee pots and just go to sleep. That's all. And I stopped by 26th and Broadway, and uh, Jimmy was there. And I walked in, and I said, hi, Jimmy. And I don't know if he said it to everybody. It really doesn't matter. I know he said it to me. I said, hi, Jimmy. How are you? And he turned and looked at me as if the world stopped. And he said, I'm much better for seeing you, my friend. I'm much better for seeing you. That little comment saved my life that day. I thought, well, if Jimmy likes me, maybe I got it all wrong. Maybe there is something worth saving. I got a friend, Scott, down in Nashville. And every time I go to Nashville, they take me to prison. He said, uh, we're going to take you to prison. You've got to talk your way out. And I usually have to. And we're in this Burger King. And Scott ordered a cup of coffee, and this woman got a cup of coffee and was coming back, and Scott said to her, I really want to thank you for coming to work today and getting that coffee so quick. It's nice and hot. You did such an excellent job. You know, you made my life better today. Thank you. And that woman's spirit just rose. And I thought, how much did that cost for a little honoring another human being? You know, over the years, I've gotten better at it. But man, he's put that bar high, and I'm going to keep working at it. Because please, God, I'll honor the people I come in contact with, whether they like me or not. That's not my business. My business is that I honor every presence that comes into my presence, because you're worth it. I went to a meeting in Pasadena, California. I was going there to speak. And... uh Right before that, I left, I thought, ooh, Pasadena, California, wealthy area. I may hook up with a job. I may, And I caught myself doing that little hustle. I need to tell you that I started all over with God after my father's death. I got down on my knees, and my first honest prayer I ever said is, God, I don't know if you're there or not. I sure hope so. It's right where I was, man. 
I hope so. And that's where I try to be every day, where I'm at with God. And I caught myself doing that hustle, and I went into the bathroom, and I said a little prayer that I said upstairs before I came down here tonight. And I said, God, save me from my own nonsense. Let me share the miracle you performed in my life through Alcoholics Anonymous, and I want absolutely nothing from any of these people. I'm already overpaid. And I went to that meeting in Pasadena, and after the meeting, a guy comes up to me and says, This makes no sense to me. We won't offer you a job. I said, It makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> he said, Have you ever been in Taiwan? I said, No. He said, Have you ever been in show business management? I said, No. He said, Be in my office Monday morning. That's Saturday. Went to his office Monday morning. Thursday, I was lifting out of LAX, Los Angeles International Airport, going to Taipei, Taiwan. I was the new soon-to-be vice president of America on ice. I had a cast of 62. I was going over to Taipei, Taiwan to negotiate contracts with the Taiwanese government, build the ice rink, the skating rink, the, and living arrangements, while flying back and forth to Hong Kong with designer Bill Campbell to design costumes. How was your week? <laughs> now, I tell you that for a very simple reason. Somewhere along the line, you got me to drop the bag of ones. There would have been a time when I wouldn't even shown up for the interview. Right. You told me I can do anything God puts in front of me, and I choose to believe that. I showed up for the interview. And I remember getting off the plane in Taipei, and everybody's this tall. <laughs> and they're looking at me, and I'm looking at them, you know. You know, it's just a matter of time before they tie me down. <laughs> and I don't have time to go into the Taiwan thing, but I, I can tell you this, that I saw that God had given me gifts and talents that I would have never known if I hadn't seen them with my own eyes. Because it's true, I was the one who wouldn't give me a break. Everybody around me, 299 out of every group of 300, was more than willing to. But I was the one in my life. You know, after we're sober for a while, it's much easier to stay in the muck than to be happy, joyous, and free. The muck's familiar. Peace is unfamiliar. It takes work to get there. It takes surrender to get there. I used to think, if I let go of all this anger, by the way, I don't work on my anger anymore. I don't process it. I give it up. That's all I know to do. Oops, sorry. Don't need that, because if I take it, you know what happens. I don't work on it anymore, and I just give it up, and God is more than willing to take that from me. In Kaohsiung, we were finishing up the tour, and this guy walked past me and said, you know, you'd be an excellent manager for the Harlem Globetrotters. And I went, ha, <laughs> ha, yes, yeah, that's pretty good. Got back to Los Angeles, and the Harlem Globetrotters called me up. They said, Mr. Mutum, we've heard wonderful things about you. Would you come into our office and talk to us? And I said, I'd be honored to. Because, you know, in my household, when I was growing up, there was only one time a year when there was any happiness that I can remember. And it seemed about this time in January, on ABC, there'd be this basketball team on that Dad loved. And he'd even be sober that day. And Mom would have popcorn made. And all the kids would sit around, and it's the only time I ever remember we all laughed. Imagine how I felt after I got that job. I was in Madison Square Garden, and they started playing Sweet George Brown. And I remember people in AA telling me, Miracles will happen if you just do this the best you can. Miracles will happen. And it's true. It's just absolutely true. It's been my experience. I remember while I was in London, I met the daughter of the Turkish ambassador. She was Muslim, beautiful, wealthy. I thought, well, our backgrounds are a lot alike. <laughs> And she, she was gorgeous, gorgeous girl. She just was. And I knew not to marry her, and I did anyway. I'm not saying that to be rude or disrespectful. It's just the truth. We should have never been married. We were married. We had three children. They all hate every breath I breathe. Because I love members of Al-Anon, especially when they're working their program. Because there's some of us around that are experienced on the other side of it. It's not too nice. It breaks people's heart, just like the alcoholism does. Alcoholism is alcoholism, whether it's the drinker or the loved one. And it's destroyed my kids. And I'd love to tell you it was better news than that. But I can't. They hate every breath I take. 
And the amazing thing about it is I can be happy, joyous, and free anyway. Freedom. Freedom from the bondage itself. I would do anything on earth, and I try consistently to mend that. Until about a year ago when God said, Ed, you've been trying for 17 years. They don't like you. They don't want even you to even be a part of your life. Just leave them alone. And I was able to do that. What a gift. What a gift. I, uh, we got divorced, thank God. For her too. I mean, I was not a good maid at that time. I wasn't, I just wasn't. It was always about me first. And you just can't have a successful relationship of any kind when that's the case. Uh, moved back to Iowa. I made some decisions based on self that cost me everything I owned. I was 18 years sober. And one day I'm driving the big yellow Mercedes and rocking and rolling. And the next day they're coming to evict me and take my Mercedes. And I'm going, I'm going to meetings. I'm helping newcomers. I'm speaking at groups. What's the deal? Well, it's very simple. What I had became who I was, and I didn't even know it. People come up to me from time to time. They say, I don't know who my God is. And I said, that's the simplest thing I can tell you. And they go, you want to know who your God is? What do you spend most of your time thinking about? There's your God, like it or not. And if you don't like the one you got, then change it. Discipline. Mental, physical, and spiritual discipline. I went back to Iowa and started fresh. I, I ended up on the same 6th Street that I was raised in. I remember somebody came up to me, and it's a bad neighborhood, always has been. Somebody came up to me and said, aren't you afraid they're gonna, everybody's gonna break into your house and take all your stuff? I said, they're in your neighborhood. They ain't looking in mine, <laughs> you know. And that's just the way it was, and I was grateful for that house. An old friend of mine let me pry the boards off the windows, and I had one single light in the mattress, and I broke out the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I read the promises. And one thing was absolutely clear to me, that they're right and I'm wrong. And if I'm, I'm not experiencing, it isn't because that's just a nice idea. It's because I haven't done something to experience what they told me I'd experience. The great thing about Alcoholics Anonymous is we can start fresh any moment of any given day. Brand new. Fresh and clean. Every day when I will start my day with a shower, I wash away the sins of the world. Fresh and clean. Why not? Why not? What is there in that baggage of yesterday that's going to make my day better today? And that's why they say in AA it's one day at a time. And in the book it talks about us being reborn. What that means is a new life. See, I kept thinking they were going to restore the old one. I was going, no thanks. I don't need it restored. Don't want it restored. Thank you very much. What I didn't understand is they were going to give me a whole new life. I went on a retreat, a Christian retreat, and I had a spiritual awakening. I hadn't planned on that. And it was a moment that changed my heart and my mind from that day to this. And I'd like to tell you about it, but I'm not sufficient with words to tell you. I just know this, that I have no argument that there's a God anymore. And God said, I need you to work with me. And I said, oh, whatever you need. Three weeks later, I was a pastor. I'm, I, I, I don't, when God tells you something that clear, you just go do it. Three weeks later, I was doing, I'd never done a sermon before. I hadn't ever done a service, but here's a bulletin there. That should help, you know. And uh, thank God for the action in AA. You just make it happen. And then uh, I said, to, I went to the church structure and I said, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to become a minister. That's what God's called me to do. And they said, well, what's it, what education do you have? I said, I have seventh grade education, but I quit paying attention a long time before that. <laughs> And they said, well, you've got to get your uh, uh, high school education, you've got to get a BA, and then you've got to get a little 96-hour master's degree. And uh, got them all. One day at a time, one hour at a time. I had my GED. I took it as a joke out at UCLA when I was living out in California. I was dating a gal named Rebecca. She was a, gra she was a graduate of Vassar, and it made her a little annoyed I didn't have a high school education. So I saw in the paper where they were giving them at UCLA to go take a test. They'll give you a high school. I said, okay. Went and took the test. They gave me one. I liked it. Here's the high school. Don't feel bad anymore. That's what got me into school. I remember walking over there to the university, and I had done this right before, about two years before, I went on that Christian retreat. I, I remember walking over there that day. I'd quit smoking, 
And the doctor told me to start running and exercising and stretching. And so I broke my leg. <laughs> and uh, had my, my leg propped up. And God talked to me again and said, Ed, what about education? And I did what any self-respecting alcoholic would do. I went, la, 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 la. <laughs> he called right back. He didn't care. And uh, when you've been around long enough and the message is that clear, you just go. And I got on my crutches and I went over there to the university and I walked in and I said, I'd like to go to school. And they said, how many credits do you have? And I said, I have bad credits. Why? What's that got to do with it? <laughs> and they laughed the same way you did. And I was able to share with them a gift you give me and I hope I never forget it. I was able to look at them and say, you don't understand. I don't know anything about going to school. I'm not sure if I'm smart enough to pass a class, but I'd like to try. Would you help me? And they said, of course we will. And I started the school. I'm not one of those, and the people I sponsor don't come up to me and say, you know, I just don't have time. I'm one of those who believe if you need 30-hour days, God will give them to you. If you need 40-hour days, he'll stretch it that far. He'll give me everything I need to do what I need to do to become who he wants me to be. And that's all my job is. I became ordained, got my master's degree. About four years ago, I was preaching on forgiveness. And right in the middle of the sermon, I realized I hadn't uh, told the guys who killed my father that I had forgiven them. What I tell you, I hated about church hypocrites. My congregation was 1,200 members and I stopped right in the middle of the sermon and I said, I will not preach on forgiveness until I've done what I'm preaching about. About two and a half weeks later, one of the guys who's uh, involved in my father's murder sentence was overturned as God would have it. And the press came to me. And I'm well loved in my community because of how you taught me to act and behave, believe me. And uh, the press came to me and said, Reverend Ed, what, what do you think? What, what's going to happen? What do you think? What we should do? I said, let him come home. Let him start fresh. And they said, he's been in there since he's 17 years old. He doesn't know how to work. How's he going to support himself? I said, he can come live with me if he'd like. And people were taken back by that. And I'm not sure why. You welcomed me. Given the right chemicals, the right situation... We could have switched places at any given time. I am obligated to give the very thing I've been given. And that's a fresh chance. And the world was amazed by that. That story literally went around the world. It was on the front page of the L.A. Times, uh, London Times. 48 Hours called me. Oprah called me. Not Oprah, but one of her producers called me. And it was kind of hard. I said, well, well, Oprah, it's kind of like step eight and nine, you know, if you're really working them. And, uh... <laughs> and uh, I didn't know on that TV interview that day that that man uh, was watching that show or watching that news. And two and a half weeks later, as God would have it, I walked into a prison I hadn't been in in many years. I used to go there all the time and visit my brother. And I swore the only way they'd carry me, get me in there is to carry me in there. I wouldn't be walking. And I'm walking down those halls. And I walk down the hall and I walk into a cell and I stick out my hand uh, to a guy I hadn't seen for 27 and a half years. Last time I saw him was in a courtroom and I said, give me five minutes with him and we don't need a trial. And I stuck out my hand and I said, Sherman, my name's Reverend Ed Muter. And I'm here to tell you that I love you and God loves you. And I forgive you and he forgives you. And if there's anything I can ever do in my life to make your life better, allow me to do that. And he looked into this old-timer's eyes and he realized it wasn't a game. That it's time to heal. Amazing thing happened. We talked for two and a half hours. And we became friends. Who would have imagined? That's impossible. Not in Alcoholics Anonymous. Not in the God that I know of. And we talked, and uh, they decided to retry him. And in the state of Iowa, I'm sure it's the same in Illinois, if you're with somebody in the commission of a death felony murder, uh, you go to prison for the rest of your life. And by Sherman's own testimony, he was there. And I went down to that Scott County attorney who uh, is a man that I love and respect. And I asked him to give my friends some mercy. 
And he said, Eddie's conning you. He's just trying to get out of prison. I said, he don't even know I'm here. See, you've taught me to do good things. I don't need to advertise it. I just need to do it. And my friend Bill cut my friend some mercy. And a year and a half later, I got the call from the Iowa Correctional Facility. Said, Reverend Mutum, we need you to come pick up Sherman. You need to be alone, no press, and we won't release him to anybody but you. And I got to drive up there and pick up Sherman. We went into a restaurant, and I said, Now, Sherman, when you go in here, they're going to ask you a bunch of questions. How do you want your eggs? What kind of toast? Da -da 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 -da. You know, he's used to 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. After it was done, he said, yeah, they did ask a lot of questions, didn't they? <laughs> when we walked out of the restaurant, there was a little pond on the right. He said, Reverend Mutum, can I stop and just look at the pond for a moment? And I said, of course you can. And I thought, how many ponds did I get to look at the last 30 years that he did? And he just stood there quietly and gazed. And I think he a bit. I was able to tell him he could open his own door and nobody's going to shoot him. He came home for a while, didn't do too well. You know, after 30 years of maximum security, you tend to get an attitude. And his didn't serve him well, and he went back for a while, and then he came home. And he lived with me then. He lived at the halfway house. Got him a little apartment. Got him some nice clothes. He met a girl, and I haven't seen him since. <laughs> and I understand that. I understand that. But I hear he's not doing too well, so if you would remember my friend Sherman in your prayers, I'd appreciate it. We think we got it tough out here. Imagine being with a group of guys who bullied you into coming and then you spend 30 years of your life paying for it, the next 30 years. He's a good man. I've looked into his eyes and I've seen the person God created. And I think that's what we see when we see a newcomer. A newcomer, when an old timer comes up and says they see some good stuff in you, or even when they're giving you a hard time, it's because they want you to stay. This is the best place I've ever been. A few years ago, the Methodist Church came to me and said, you, get, you need to make a choice, Ed. I was allowed to go speak at uh, AA meetings one Sunday a month. And uh, a new bishop came in and said, you need to make a choice. You can either do that or be a pastor for us. And man, that was an easy decision, but the toughest one I ever made. Because I will never, ever be able to repay what you've given me. So I had to leave. When I left, there was... A, they held a roast for me, and 450 people showed up. And I was sitting there, and only one person got up, and they said, we don't want to say anything bad about Pastor Ed, even kid. We just want to tell him that we love him. And we thank him for the example of faith he set in our life. And when he's been there, when our loved ones died, and he walked with us. And that he's in our prayers, and wherever you go, and whatever you do, we'll love you. That was six miles approximately from 6th and Leclerc for January 5th, 1971. I laid in the middle of the street pretending like I was knocked out. You know and I know nothing but God can explain that one. And it's not about me being special at all. It's about each and every one of us. You know, in the history of our lifetime, there'll never be another you. That's how special you are. You hear a lot of things in A. One of the things they say, well, remember when you're pointing that finger back, there's you're pointing at them, there's three pointing back at you. You heard that one? What you don't hear is this. And if you see something wonderful and inspiring and lovely in someone else, the only way you know it is it already exists in you. I believe that I already am the person God wants me to be. I just need to learn to behave that way. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love God and I love being so. I don't apologize for any of the three. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.